Welcome to Feminism Today, everyone. I'm Sophia Johnson in New York. We are kicking off the summer music series with Ray Zaragoza, the LA-based songwriter who has always made a career writing political folk music that is informed by her identity as a woman of mixed indigenous Asian and Latina heritage. You, you may remember her from back in 2016 when she gained national recognition with In the River, which was written to protest the Dakota Access Pipeline. Rolling Stone magazine calls her one of the most fresh and compelling voices in folk music today. Her forthcoming album, Hold That Spirit, will be released on August 11th, and she joins us to discuss it. Ray, welcome to Feminism Today. Hello, how are you? Thank you for having Very me. Very good. I'm so glad to see you. I love that you write a lot about identity mm -hmm. and your experiences as a woman of mixed heritage. Why do you think it's important to speak plainly and clearly about who we are and what we stand for? I think it's so important to speak about who we are and what we stand for in music because I think for so for so many hundreds of years you know, we've been silenced to not share our stories or to, or many, many times our stories haven't been told by um, ourselves, but getting to represent ourselves. And I think that's, it's so important now with music, media, everything, have representation, have diverse people sharing their stories um, because it hasn't been done for so long. And so I, I always try not to shy away from being very outspoken about my story and being proud of being mixed race. And it's always something that's definitely weighed on me as a person. And it's something that has definitely shaped the way I interact with the world and I interact with the people around me. And so it's only natural that I'm going to write songs about it. And yeah. I read you were born and raised in Manhattan in what you describe as a tiny uh, apartment, a melting pot of culture, so to speak. Can you tell us about how this almost quintessential or classical New York experience informed or shaped the woman and artists you have become? Absolutely, yes. I love I love talking about my upbringing and growing up in New York City. Uh, I grew up in a 400 square foot studio apartment above a firehouse in lower Manhattan. And uh, it really was a quintessential New York City upbringing. I was truly a city kid, tr like through and through since I was a kid, you know, we were, doing everything on our own at very young ages, like between like eight and 10, we were on the subways by ourselves and doing everything on our own. And I think it really uh, changed my life and informed my music because I grew up really fast. And I think I was always ready for a career in the arts from the time I was like 12 years old. I just always knew that's what I wanted to do. And it felt possible because everyone around me in this big, beautiful city was doing it. And Broadway was right there. And uh, I lived near Bleecker Street with all these music venues. They were right there. And so it felt possible. And so there was never a doubt in my mind that even at a young age that I could be a performer because it was right in front of me. Yeah. What was calling you to L.A.? Actually, I moved out to L.A. Uh, when I was 14 with my family because my dad's from California. So they moved us all out here. I quickly moved back to New York when I was like 20 after high school. And then I lived in New York for a few years when I got my music career started. And then I moved back to LA because living in New York as a young adult is not easy. It's a very expensive city yeah. as is LA, but New York is, is an exceptional challenge. Yeah. Yeah. So tell me, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the album. What mm -hmm. inspired a lot bit really about the album. <laughs> what inspired hold that spirit? What is the album reflecting back to the world? Um, well, that spirit is really about my journey to finding center and finding peace. Um, I mean, you know, some form of it, obviously, I don't feel at peace every day of my life, but it's a lot about finding that inner spirit and that inner center to keep you grounded during difficult times. There's songs on this record that are about identity as well. There's songs about um, my experience in a relationship where uh, over the course of a year, over the course of a month, I, I got engaged and then we broke up and really like kind of s sitting with the expectations of women and my own thoughts that I had to be married by a certain age. I had to be, have kids by a certain age. I had to like m do all of these things and then realizing that my life wasn't going in that path after this breakup. And um, so a lot of the songs are about that. And so it's really about kind of rising from within yourself when you're going through tough times um, and 
learning to be resilient even when it doesn't feel possible. Yeah. There is a, a feminist undercurrent that's almost uniting the album, right? And I read the uh, new single co-written by Anna Schultz set up to set the tone for the full album. Can you talk a little bit about how that collaboration came about? Um, Anna and I actually met through Secret Road. Um, we both work with Secret Road for um, sync licensing. So they help us get our music into movies and television. And so we met through them. They set us up on a right. And I know like immediately when I met her, uh, we would have these writing sessions where we would literally talk for three to four hours and then write a song in the last hour. And I felt like writing with Anna was like therapy. <laughs> and I think it really shows in the songs. Um, Hold That Spirit, the second single that has already come out, and also Not a Monster, the single, um, the last single before the album release that's coming out, um, both were written and produced by with Anna. And I just felt like I was able to be vulnerable on like a new level with her. Um, and it shows in the music. And I think part of that is because I really trust her. Like she felt like a sister to me, she feels like a sister to me. And that's why it was so easy to be so vulnerable in these songs because they were all written and produced by women. Oh, I just love that. I mean, there's sort of a, an, an empowerment um, experience. There's an empowering experience listening to your music for sure. Um, and in fact, it feels a lot like this album. The songs that I've listened to, um, not you know, there's only two tracks I've, I've heard from this album, but your earlier work, it feels a lot like you're giving listeners some sort of agency, some sort of power, a take back your power type of a, a, a vibe, which I think, you know, and some of the critics certainly agree. Um, it, it feels like it's very, it's contemplative work. It's folk work. It, it sort of leans into the work of Joni Mitchell, for example. I wanted to know if you've ever worked with her, if you've asked questions to work with her, and how has she inspired your work? How has she inspired your work? Oh my gosh, Joni Mitchell is one of my heroes. And it would be a dream to meet her uh, and work with her, of course. But um, yeah, I mean, her song, California, was the song that I listened to every day when I was living in California. Um, all of her songs. I mean, the Blue Album is really what I changed. Like, I listened to on repeat over and over when I was, like, um, you know, in my middle school days. And um, I adore her. And I really do like, you know, the words being used, like, contemplative and 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 what you were talking about, about trying to, like, pull something out of the audience. Um, you know, I got my start playing at rallies, you know, when I started playing music. I was like plugging into like, you know, pretty, you know, bad sound systems or megaphones and playing music at rallies during the Standing Rock movement when my song in the river, um, you know, uh, was circulating. And so now I feel like whenever I write music, or whenever I play or I'm producing music, it's about being at a rally. It's about like, it's all my songs feel like rally songs, even there, even if they're ballads everything is about like provoking an emotion. It's about like rallying an audience and a call to action in many ways. It's even if the song isn't really political in any way, I feel like everything's a call to action. And I listen to music to be inspired and I hope that my music does that for other people. And that's always the intention for sure. But it feels that way. It feels like, um, it's like revolutionary music, right? It's stirring something inside of you with, with the view towards sort of taking action. So I love that that's what you put in because that's what I've certainly felt. Um, I read that and you just sort of mentioned it a little bit that you had this aha moment um, after one month of engagement and you sort of decided that you were going to certainly move in another direction. I think, you know, as a woman, I can certainly under I understand all those decisions and the emotions that go into it. I wonder if we can talk a little bit, if we could touch a little bit about on you know, how that experience moved you? How has your view of beauty and ageism changed or shifted and whether or not it's really shifted since you've had that experience? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I kind of honestly feel like a rebirth, like I'm like a baby now, <laughs> but I'm like 30. I feel like it's like this fresh start of a new decade. Whereas like when I was 29, I felt like I was, it was like the end of an era. And now it feels like, like a rebirth, like, in, like the beginning of an era. And it's a really fresh and beautiful feeling because I think a lot of, there's, there is definitely a lot of themes of ageism and the, the grappling with ageism in this record because I talk about, um, you know, my struggle with eating disorders and also my breakup. And I think that this relationship was moving in a direction that I was very dead set on it going in because I was turning 30 
um, amongst other reasons, of course, um, you know, every relationship has its good and bad. Um, I was definitely very dead set on making this work, even though it wasn't working because I realized I was getting older. And I've always been told that if you're not married by 30, you're going to die alone, which obviously is not true. It's completely not true. That. And, um, but I had that in my head and I think I was operated, operating under that um, for my whole life. And now I'm realizing that there is no rule book for women. There is no right and wrong. There is no cookie cutter formula that's going to work for all of us in our lives. And some people, um, you know, maybe do get married at that time. And maybe some people don't, and there's happiness and unhappiness in both places. And we just have to follow our own bliss and, and, and figure out what works for us. Um, and I think that these expectations for myself were not helpful because I was so dead set on these benchmarks, these materialistic, um, goals. Like I have to have a house by this age. I have to have this by that age. Um, I have to look this way. I have to make sure that I maintain my youth because I'm going to become irrelevant in music if I'm not youthful. All of which I am like, wow, like what is that? I hate all of those things. I do not want to think those things. I don't want my 18 year old, 14 year old, 13 year old fans to think those things. So how can I share my journey of unlearning a lot of those things so I can share that with my younger audience that they don't have to torture themselves with those expectations and goals that they may or may not end up doing. And so, yeah, I think that that whole thought process is embedded in this album. <laughs> I love that. So you have liberated yourself from social mores that were not correct anyway. Yeah. And along the way, you used some of the money from that you saved up for the wedding to, to create this beautiful album. Tell us about the rebirth. Like, how did that decision come about and what to do with the money? Yeah, you know, it was actually kind of funny because uh, on my last album, my parents offered, I, I wasn't, I wasn't like really in this place of, um, I wasn't dating anyone at the time when I was uh, making my last album. And, um, you know, my parents have like a, a, a humble amount of very generous, humble amount of savings for my wedding. And they asked, they were like, why don't you just use it on your album instead? <laughs> and I was like, so offended. Oh. I was like, you think I'm never going to find love. <laughs> um, and so then when this relationship fell apart and I was making this album, I also had like my own savings. And then I had this like, bit of savings that my parents had and we all were ingredients we were like let's put it on this album and so yeah. um yeah I acknowledge like the privilege I have to have had a wedding savings both from myself and from my parents and the fact that I could put it into music like yeah. was so, was really wonderful to me yeah. and felt like a more um just like a more grounded and authentic place for me to put that money personally I think that yeah. there's other people were that's not their path they don't want to make an album yeah yeah, yeah. Um, and I did have three weeks of planning a wedding. Um, and I realized that I don't, it doesn't, it's not something that I really want. Even if I do get married, I think I want something. I don't want to spend a lot of money on a, a, a party. It's just not really for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, 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 with me. So, um, yeah, I just, I, I wanted to talk about this openly and to, really share about how my wedding funds are being used for the record. Um, because one, I wanted to kind of show people that there are different paths in life and I'm choosing a different path with like this savings and that that's nothing to be ashamed of and I'm proud of it. And, you know, when I posted online about my engagement, I got more likes and engagement and responses from people in my life more so than any music I've ever released or any post about anything ever like oh, wow. so much more exciting to anyone than any album release and part of me like thought that was a little weird and like we should be celebrating women for a multitude of things not only engagements and marriage which we should celebrate like that's yes. so valid but we should also celebrate women for like paying off their debts or for um graduating from this or from achieving that or yeah releasing albums and yeah. I just think that there's such a vast and beautiful story that we all have to tell and every story is going to be different and this one's mine 
And I thank you for that because it is really, um, there's a lot of symbolism in that because you mentioned there's a small footnote. Well, well, you know, maybe you think I'm not going to find love, but this is a, this is a product of love. Music is yeah. love. It's an extension of the loving in you. So I think you have certainly given birth to something very beautiful. And so for yeah. that, I think audiences will be very, very pleased. Thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. So you have said another important um, takeaway from just reviewing your material, your entire portfolio, you have said elsewhere, you wanted to make live music more economically accessible. Mm -hmm. What do we as a society get right or wrong about music and access in the 21st century or in the United States? What do we get right and wrong? That's a really good, good question. I think what's, what's interesting is like, you know, when I'm talking to my agent about like booking my shows, um, agents generally have like a Rolodex of venues that are mostly in big cities that then, you know, are mostly represented by Live Nation or these really big, big um, corporations. And it's just like kind of where you go and they kind of fill in the gaps of all of their artists and you play here, you play there. My last artist played there, so you play there again. There's a lot of communities that are not close to big cities that are not getting to have the same access to touring live music. Um, and, you know, I'm guilty for someone who definitely mostly plays in big cities because it's that's just where you're routed and you get on the tour and you go. But I really do try as much as I can to access smaller communities, um, especially indigenous communities around the country that I can um, even if it's out of my way or a place that I've never played, I try my best to really route into different places because so often we're we're only playing to um, those who have immediate access to live music, like in large cities. Um, I also think that it's just important. I, I try to, you know, even as I, I am able to charge more for shows or I'm able to have this growth, I always try to make as many free shows as I can as possible, as many like shows that allow children to come a lot of shows are 18 and over, 21 and over. I really try to make it so that my music can be accessed by people of all different communities, all different ages, all different walks of life. Um, because oftentimes it feels like music, live music at least, can be so much more easily accessed by people with um, a level of privilege. If they have a night they can take off or they can get childcare or they have access to a big city, sometimes it's not possible to drive three hours to a concert and so I do my best to do that and, and to offer um, online things, online concerts and things like that. But for me, I think the biggest thing is trying to access communities around the country that are not only big cities and making sure that we are, you know, as touring artists, um, really like broadening our scope of what it means to be a touring artist and to um, tend to like really spread our wings to places that we maybe wouldn't have um, our agent wouldn't have routed us to. <laughs> what do you think audiences, economically disadvantaged people, right? You want to make it economically accessible. Yeah. What do different audiences experience? What's your observation about how different audiences um, experience your music? Mm. That's a good question. Like how do different audiences experience my music? I mean, you know, yesterday, um, you know, just for an example, like I, there's something so special for me about, I, I played a free show um, at the Indigenous Red Market in Oakland, California. And um, to me, like this show was like playing for, you know, like cousins, like brothers, sisters, like people within my community. And the fact that it was a free show and I could have all of these people like come to the show and, and have kids come and everything. It just felt so it felt like such a beautiful day. And um, a lot of people in the indigenous community are also mixed race like me. And to get to like play these songs and share these stories with people who not only enjoy the music, but also really experience a lot of the things I'm talking about on a day-to-day -day basis as well, being mixed race. Um, that was really beautiful. And so I think, you know, I'm not really sure about you know, how every, how every different kind of person experiences my music. But I, I can say that I think when I play for people who have also experienced life in a similar way to me, which is honestly most people, we all have yeah. a level of dealing with anxiety and an identity. Um, but getting to play for a community like that in Oakland with the indigenous market, I think was one of those days where I left the stage, like kind of in tears, I felt seen because I feel like the audience felt seen. 
Yeah, you write about and you've sort of talked about, I'm just on that, that point, you've talked about being seen. What does being seen mean to you as um, a woman of mixed heritage? What does that mean? Being seen um, to me feels like just being accepted for who you are and all the things that you are um, and not needing to be, you know, I think when I was a kid, I, I, what I had so much insecurity about was I felt like I couldn't identify with anything because I was so many things. And uh, everyone I met wanted me to be a different part of myself. So if I was, you know, if I was with this group of people, it was with my mom's family, I felt like, oh, I'm, I'm Asian. Or if I'm with my dad's family, I'm like, oh, like, you know, we're indigenous or Latinx. And I, d- I never felt like a place in my life where I could be all of it. I felt like it was either one or the other. And yet I'd never felt one or the other because I felt so confused by my own identity. And so to be seen for me is to feel like I can be all of it at once. Um, and I think that everyone has their own version of that, I th- whether it's like your ethnicity or whether it's any other part of your identity, but just to have places where you can feel like you can be all of it and you don't, you don't have to be ashamed or hide any part of yourself and you can be proud of it. Um, and I think that with my music and with my shows, I want to create that space for as many people as possible. Um, not only people who are, you know, mixed race, but just people who feel different parts of their identities and they feel the nuance of their existence and they just want to feel um, accepted. Yeah, I love that. So you are an amazing artist, a quintessential artist. Um, and I want to spend a couple of minutes talking a little bit about your work on the Netflix animated series, Spirit Rangers. Um, was this also about increasing access, about being seen? How did you get involved with this project? Yes, absolutely. I think Spirit Rangers is all about, um, you know, increasing access to to kids, um, you know, who get to hear stories about indigenous children and stories that they can relate to. Um, but uh, anyway, so I got connected with this project because my former neighbor uh, is a writer on the show and he asked me if I wanted to like, you know, try out, do a composer test for it. And so I did, I like auditioned, you know, I, I made a song and see yeah. if they liked it and they loved it. And then I got the yeah. job uh, and working on Spirit Rangers was one of the most special experiences of my life. Um, you know, Spirit Rangers is about a, um, a Shumash Cowlitz family that lives in a national park. Um, and the kids are junior park rangers, and then they also can transform into their um, their spirit selves, where they're animals, and they get to save the day at, as rangers in the spirit park. And so they get to meet lots of different spirits, and uh, you know, a lizard spirit, a coyote spirit, all these different spirits. And every single episode features different um, indigenous stories, indigenous folklore from uh, from native um, peoples all over really the world. Um, wow. And so it was very educational for me. I, I got to learn about things that I never learned about. And the fact that this is accessible now to children, indigenous children and 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 all children is really special because I think that native kids are going to feel so seen by it. And then non-native kids are going to feel so excited to learn about something that they do not learn in school. Yeah. And it's also very entertaining. So, and I get, yeah, there's a song in every episode that I write and, uh, Oh, gosh, yeah. Spirit Rangers is so fun. I love it. <laughs> Fantastic. We're definitely going to have to see if we can get access to some of that. Yeah. Um, my children watch uh, Molly of Denali. That's yes, Molly thing. Is a great yeah. show. Yes, we so are. When I, heard, when I read about your work with Spirit Rangers, I was like, oh, my goodness. They're going to love it. They're going to love it. They're going to love it. Um, <laughs> this is great. So hold that spirit then returning back to this amazing, beautiful, sultry album is it's complicated, but it's rooted in some very specific hardships Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, certainly resonate with people across the board, right? Can you talk about some of that hardship and how it strengthened you along the way and, um, you know, what you're hoping, I think you talked a little bit about it, but what you're hoping um, listeners can take away from, from your music. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this album definitely has a lot of themes of hardship. And, you know, I've now that it's done and I'm, I can look back on it, I was like, wow, there's a lot of heavy stuff in here. <laughs> and I, I definitely think that this album is like my most vulnerable um, body of work that I've ever worked on or released. And so um, it's exciting, but it's also scary to like put that out in the world. And um, one of the things I'll talk about um, that we haven't touched on yet that 
is one of the hardships I talk about in this record is um, my struggle with disordered eating. And there's a song about it called Not a Monster. That's the third single coming out. And um, I've struggled with disordered eating for my whole life, pretty much. Well, I guess since I was a teenager. But and I'm very, very, very open with my audience on social media and in my shows and everything. But this is something that I've never talked about. And I consciously never talked about something that I've kept very um, hidden, very like under wraps because it was something that I wasn't really dealing with. It was something that I kind of struggled in silence about because um, I didn't want anyone to know because I didn't want to be held accountable to get better. I was very, um, you know, very almost okay with just not being okay. And it felt like it would never go away and I had no way out. So why talk about it? Um, but this album, I decided I want to talk about it, especially because a lot with a lot of my music and being um, someone that prides himself on being a feminist and being someone who's trying to inspire women. I feel like if I can talk about this openly and if I can inspire other young women out there who may be struggling to seek help, um, that's something that I really value. And so I started talking about it and um, about my process of healing and the song Not a Monster is about accepting yourself for who you are and learning how to heal your relationship to your body. And um, I know it's something that so many people struggle with. And so it's been really um, cathartic and beautiful for me to get to talk about it and to have a song on my album about it. I wonder if you could just sort of give us some, uh, what are your thoughts on self-care and how important that is in the world that we find ourselves in? I mean, you know, the Yes. I mean, I keep calling it self-care summer right now. It's all of the love it. summer. I love it. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, sometimes we feel shame around self-care. We think that it's something for rich people. We think that it's something for privileged people or something like for people who don't have responsibilities and it's selfish and things like that, but it's really not. And, it, and it's really something you can do with small parts of your day. I mean, there's so many little things I do that are self-care for me during my day. I love drinking like hot water in the morning and sitting and like, looking out the window. And I love um, meditating, I love journaling. Um, I love taking a walk by myself to go get a boba. Like there's just like little things in my day. Um, I love baths so much on floor. Baths save me. Um, and I I love just taking a night to like sit on the couch and watch TV and just completely veg out and do not do anything productive. And yeah. that's self care. And yeah. when I kind of like lock into what makes you relax and you can just do those things in the practice yeah it really helps and it makes you more centered and in less in less of a stress like fight or flight spot space that i feel like we so often are in constantly yeah yeah i'm all about self-care summer <laughs> yes on that note self-care summer ray zaragoza is an la-based songwriter we go out with the title track of your new album hold that spirit which will be released august 11th thank you so much for kicking off helping us kick off feminism today summer summer music series Thank you so much. So great to talk to you, Sophia. And that's it for our program today. Remember, you can follow me and the show on Instagram or Twitter. Thank you so much for watching Feminism Today on Free Speech TV. Join us again next week.